Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. It's nice to see a decent crowd. Uh, my name is Bennett Simpson. I'm curator here at the museum, and um, it is a pleasure to welcome you to uh, the Geffen and to this walkthrough of our Laura Owens exhibition. Who here knows Laura Owens' work? I bet you guys, a lot of you all are from LA, so you're perhaps familiar with this artist. Um, Laura is um, uh, one of the artists, one of the painters of her generation that um, has helped kind of keep, make, put uh, Los Angeles uh, on the international um, art map, or actually that's a dumb thing to say. She's just a, she's a good artist um, who has made a lot of work that people really like and more and more people are paying attention to it. So how about that? Um, this is a survey of her work. Uh, it was organized by, it wasn't organized by uh, MOCA, by the Museum of Contemporary Art. It was organized by a museum in New York, the Whitney Museum of American Art. And um, the show then toured, went on the road. This is the third stop and final stop on the tour. We are um, following the Dallas Museum of Art. It's, I mean, it's interesting to me. I don't know if it's interesting to you the way that these, uh, way that exhibitions kind of travel around the country. Every, every time they appear, they are slightly different uh, for different reasons. They're different because the works in them are different and the works change and they're different because the buildings are different and the museums are different. So if you saw, if you happen to see the exhibition in, in New York, um, it, it, it doesn't, it didn't look like this or this doesn't look like that. Um, it, it's a, it's a somewhat different exhibition and maybe we'll, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, but some background, Laura Owens was born in Ohio, outside of Cleveland, grew up outside of Cleveland. She went to school at um, Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island, and then came out here to Los Angeles in the early 90s to get a master's in fine arts at CalArts. Uh, when she got out of CalArts, she um, stayed. There was a time in Los Angeles art history, in the Los Angeles art world, when people would go to school here and then they would leave. They would go to New York or they would go to Europe or they would go somewhere, but um, over the course of the, really over the, starting in the 80s and into the 90s, there was more and more reasons for artists to stay here um, and teach and set up studios and uh, exhibit, more and more galleries for artists to exhibit in. So Laura stayed. Um, she, in the beginning of her, uh, in the beginning of her exhibiting career, uh, she showed at galleries like Acme and Rosamund Felsen. She was in group shows at Blum and Poe. Um, and then there is a period of um, a long time, maybe 10 to 15 years, when she doesn't show very regularly in Los Angeles. And I say this to you just because um, you probably haven't seen a lot of the art that you're going to look at in here, because it hadn't been shown in, in LA. Um, except 15 years ago uh, at this museum. Uh, in 2003, 2004, MOCA uh, organized a kind of early career survey of Laura's work. Um, she had been making work for really only about 10 years, or exhibiting work for only about 10 years. And the, the chief curator here at the time, Paul Schimmel, uh, sort of said, I think she's great, I, people should know about her, and we're gonna, we're gonna mount a, a show. Um, that show really helped put Laura on the map, so to speak. Uh, and when we were thinking about bringing this exhibition to, to this building, there was, you know, there were a lot of conversations about what it would mean to, to do a, a second show of, of Laura's work. Um, in the end, we, we thought it was uh, a good, good idea because frankly, a lot of people hadn't seen her work over the years here. And also, so there is so much work as you will see since that first exhibition. When the show happened, Laura was the youngest artist ever to have a solo show at MOCA, um, a, a big solo show. And I guess she's, you know, she, she that, there hasn't been anyone younger to have a, a big solo show at MOCA, so whatever that means. Um, okay, painting. Laura Owens is very much a painter, um, but she's a painter that, that is cognizant of all kinds of tricks. 
and all kinds of um, problems in, in her medium. Um, she is a painter who um, sort of pushes and pulls at the, the, the formal and technical and aesthetic, art historical um, strands, ropes of her art. Uh, and we put this painting here, apart from the fact that it's kind of a fetching image, um, because it sort of speaks to this. Um, on, let's, why don't we walk in a little bit? So I'm not going to talk about every painting in the show. That would be tedious for you and for me. Um, but, I, but, but I will kind of walk through the different phases and the different um, bodies of work as, as we go. I think I'll probably talk for about 45 minutes, and then you guys can ask questions if you want. Um, this is a more recent painting. This is a painting from 2014. And I put, we put it here because it kind of demonstrates a lot of the things that Laura Owens is now recognized for. Um, um, color, scale, um, uh, paintings inside paintings, things on top of the surface of paintings, um, uh, figurative material that seems like it comes from anywhere but the, 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 the kind of um, the canon of, of high art painting. In this case, you're looking at what appears to be a kind of greeting card or maybe a motivational poster from the 70s or early 80s. This little boy and his dog um, hanging on a rope, swinging towards you. Um, there's this kind of feel-good uh, aphorism or slogan or, or phrase next to it. When you come to the end of your rope, make a knot and hang on. It's going to be okay. Uh, hang on. Um, and, and hang. There's an echo down here that I like, that I think is kind of important. Um, but also, you know, this, this kid seems to have been sliced open. The surface of the painting seems to have been sliced. There's an illusion going on, and the, 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 the kid uh, is, is splitting open, and beneath the kid, or inside the kid, there's an identical kid. There's the same kid. Uh, and on top of him, there appear to be kind of um, brush strokes, um, or not brush strokes, maybe, because this really does look like a digital kind of uh, arrangement. Um, maybe kind of cursor strokes made in a painting program or dra drawing program. Um, digital scribble, I think Christopher Knight called it the other day. Um, on top of that, there is three-dimensional stuff. There's this kind of lattice, this broken lattice, um, which to me maybe speaks to um, the, the grid, the grid, the, the kind of the, 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 the formal device of the grid, which has played such an important role in the history of, of Western painting, um, signaling perspective, signaling organization, signaling um, uh, a, a, a kind of map of visual space. But this, this grid is busted open and it's kind of coming off, and it produces its own shadows on the wall, which are like the fake shadows or drop shadows that have been produced in the painting. Um, Laura Owens's work is just, um, it's so full of visual effects, you know? Um, and it's, you have to kind of take all of these effects, try to figure out a way to hold all of these diverse and different and dizzying and, uh, you know, all of these effects, you have to hold them together. You have to hold them at once and try to sort of figure out what, what the result is, what it means. Um, maybe, maybe that's not right. Maybe it's not right even to ask what this means. Um, maybe it's just right to figure out what's going on. Uh, maybe it's right to figure out, figure out uh, to ask like, you know, how it was made or maybe eventually to ask why it was made. Um, but that's not a question that I can answer, and that's not a question that Laura will answer. Um, that's, that's also okay. Uh, when you come to the end of your rope, make a knot and hang on. The rope in this case, I think, would be painting. Laura's hanging on to it, like this boy. Let's go into here. I don't know if you all are interested in the history of contemporary art or how things develop or how things sort of 
signify from one moment to the next. Um, to me, it's interesting. Uh, when Laura was in school in the, in the early 90s, late, let's say late 80s through the early to mid 90s, um, it was not a moment really when painting was all that cool. Painting wasn't that cool. Painting was, um, uh, people were really skeptical of painting within the academy and other kinds of art forms were, um, uh, well, trendy. Um, performance, video, um, uh, installation art. Um, painting was something that um, on the one hand it seemed to have run its course in the kind of real canonical art historical trajectory of the medium um, you know in, in this country um, then had been kind of re recuperated or resuscitated in the 80s in this kind of brash neo-expressionist uh, way and that wasn't what Laura was interested in. She wasn't interested really in kind of the, the older kinds of ab abstract expressionistic oriented painting. She was coming at painting from very, very different places. She was coming from painting, coming at painting from places like children's books or places like greeting cards or places like embroidery or, um, you know, uh, deck the decorative. Um, and or as Knight said the other day, the middle brow. Um, places that were neither, um, uh, neither elevated or uh, within the canon or sort of debased, de-skilled um, outside the canon. She was coming at it from this kind of almost kitschy place. And this, this is a painting that um, for me really demonstrates this. She said, she said to me that once that this painting was, um, she, she and her friends at the time in the, uh, when the, in the late 90s when this work was made were interested in how many animals they could fit onto a canvas and still get away with it um, <laughs> uh, before it, it fell apart somehow or before it became too much. Um, there are a lot of animals in here. Um, bunnies and squirrels and butterflies and monkeys and owls and a bear and um, more monkeys over there, gibbons and um, the, yeah, fish, um, flowers. But then there are playing cards because you know bears like to play cards. Um, there are playing cards in here. And to me, the playing card is sort of a, a sign that, um, that Laura's trying to communicate with the viewer that, um, that she knows that this is a kind of um, game or a kind of uh, um, trick or a kind of um, uh, interaction between people. Uh, when I first, this, is, this, is, this work comes from the period when I first learned about Laura's art, uh, kind of in the uh, late 90s. Uh, I was living in New York at the time. Laura was living out here. Uh, but she was showing a lot in New York at Gavin Brown's Enterprise Gallery, which um, uh, was a really is, remains a, a very prominent and important gallery in, in the city. And I saw these kinds of paintings and I had no idea what to do with them, you know? They, they weren't serious, they weren't intellectual, they weren't um, full of uh, the kinds of references that I thought you know, serious and intellectual art was supposed to contain. I didn't understand the, the, the playful nature of them. I wasn't interested in animals. Um, I liked politics and I liked literature and I liked, you know, all of this other stuff. And to me, this seemed like too light somehow. Um, only later, really significantly late, much later, did I realize that those were um, kind of false, it was a sort of false, it was a trap, that I was sort of in a trap, and that I didn't have to exclude the, the legitimacy of something like this um, uh, in, uh, from, from what I thought art was supposed to be. So I would say that there is a, you know, politicians often talk about evolving on certain issues. Um, uh, I think I evolved on looking at Laura's art, and this is, this, I, that's, I'm into that, I like that. I like that one's mind changes, one's taste changes, one's ideas change. Uh, what one thought one had to exclude or not allow um, can become something that is very fascinating uh, and meaningful at another time. So um, you will see 
you will, you know, you will see some of these early uh, figures or motifs uh, in this kind of work uh, repeated elsewhere much later on. Um, more monkeys, um, some soccer players hugging each other, monkeys hugging each other, a couple in bed there. One of the things that, about Laura's iconography that I didn't really anticipate was how much um, physical intimacy there, there was in it. How many instances of people hugging or, or being close to each other or kissing there are. Um, I'm not gonna read into that except just on a formal level, um, which is sort of like when you, when, you have two, when you have a couple, you have two, and there is a space in between them that becomes very important, a kind of negative space. And that's, uh, I think, if I were to hazard a guess as to what all of these couples mean in Laura's work, I would say it's, it's kind of about that. It's about that kind of spatial tension and uh, positive and negative space. This painting is based on a famous Toulouse-Lautrec painting uh, of a, a couple in bed. Um, if, we go, if we look in this room right here, we see some actual beds. Uh, we see some of you can come in, it's, it's a little tight. Uh, so this, this work, this room really, is, uh, is, is a collaboration of sorts between Laura and Jorge Pardo, the artist Jorge Pardo. Pardo, you may know, um, lived here in LA for a long, long time, now lives in the Yucatan in Mexico. Um, Pardo, you may know, is, is, is kind of one of these artists that, that really pressed on questions of design and sculpture and taste um, uh, kind of dug into the, 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 the history of the aesthetics of design uh, in his work, made these beautiful lamps, made all kinds of furniture like this. Anyway, um, Jorge had a show and uh, he asked Laura to make a painting for it. Uh, and Laura said, well, I don't know. Um, I've, I've got, all I've got, all I've got right now are these, bee I've, I have this beehive painting um, and uh, Jorge said, yeah, that's great. Um, can you make more of them? Uh, and so they, this, this kind of collaboration was born. Um, this room, this body of work, um, actually when it, was, when it was first exhibited, was exhibited as a Jorge Pardo exhibition, a Jorge Pardo installation that featured work by Laura Owens. So now it's in a Laura Owens show featuring work by Jorge Pardo, so the tables kind of turned a little bit. Um, at the time, they were a couple and were, um, uh, you know, in the middle of a scene here in Los Angeles that was a very, very active, important art, art scene. Um, so why don't we come back out here? Uh, <clears throat> After after the, the first Mocha show, Laura's first Mocha show in the early 2000s, um, I think there, there, there began a moment where she didn't show a lot. Um, and if you hear her tell it, she says, well, no one was interested in my work, the Mocha show, nobody, nobody liked it, no one knew what to do with it, the galleries couldn't sell anything, um, I wanted to get out of LA, um, and so she began a period of, of, of a fair amount of travel. She spent a fair amount of time back in Ohio at her, at her family's house. She began um, working on a scale that was, more, that was smaller, um, that was more intimate, that was sort of more traditional. She began thinking about how um, the individual canvas, the individual painting could contain everything she needed it to contain, that she didn't need to kind of allude to things off the canvas or to, to site-specific installations or things like those, that room that she did with, with Jorge Pardo, that the, the individual canvas could just be, that's enough, that could be enough. And so she made a lot of these, these kinds of small paintings more, um, you know, you look at them and you can, you can sense a person making this. Um, you don't sense like, uh, when I look at some of those larger paintings in the beginning, I think about like, it doesn't, I don't really almost think of a person, I think of like um, a bunch of art historical forces coming together to conspire for or against a type of painting. Here I think about Laura in a room with a small panel, with a brush, making a painting. Um, they're strange, they're strange things. Um, three hands kind of wrapped around each other um, that look like a, 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 a bouquet. 
um, an actual bouquet without flowers but with buttons. Um, this, you know, these, these kinds of childlike drawings. Um, a pirate ship. More, more lovers. Maybe Garden of Eden kind of scene. Um, the color become, is starting to become a lot more, uh, well, it's a lot more fluorescent, a lot hotter, a little, lot more high keyed. Um, the work feels looser somehow and more personal. Um, and the sources are all over the place, you know, medieval tapestries. Uh, a kind of a riff on a medieval tapestry made at the time of the Iraq War in 2004, 2005. Um, I just, you know, I, the, it, it, endlessly fascinating to look at these, these, these different paintings. Laura uh, didn't know what to do with the work from this period when, or she, as she explains it, when she was making the show for the Whitney, um, they didn't really exactly know what to do with all of that work from this period. All of there were many, many smaller paintings with like no con consistent iconography. Um, it's not like this is one body of work. These are a bunch of individual paintings that were made over several years. And so she, she and the curator Scott Rothkopf decided that they would just all put them, jam them together in a kind of salon style hang. Um, I like the diversity and the dynamism and the kind of. Um, uh, difference of, of all of these canvases. It makes me think of what you guys are sitting on, these catalogs. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a cool thing, the book that was made for this show, and I encourage you all to look at it if you're interested. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of a scrapbook, it's kind of a c collage in, in its own right of source materials, um, anecdotes, emails, doodles, um, receipts, budgets from exhibitions, um, faxes to her dealers demanding money, um, you name it. There's like so much stuff in this catalog. Um, it's kind of like this wall in a way. I should also point out that um, you're sitting on artwork, you're sitting on these bench cushions that Laura designed herself and hand embroidered along the edges of them. They all have um, little motifs taken from her paintings, animals, butterflies, seagulls, that kind of thing. Um, she uh, wanted everything in her show to have her touch on it, to, um, to kind of um, resist the institutional neutrality and um, generic quality that, that is so, so common when you are in, a, in an exhibition. Um, and so she just, you know, she made these, she devised these really interesting benches. Let's go in here. Okay, this long gallery is, is, is kind of, is held by two works of art for the most, um, I say two works of art, two, two series, let's say. Uh, on this side, there is a series of seven paintings that belong together that um, date from 2003. 13 or 14, I think. Um, they are titled collectively Pavement Karaoke. Um, after the, you know, the, the, the indie rock band, the underground rock band Pavement from the 1990s. Um, so it'd be like saying, you know, Donna Summer Karaoke, but Pavement Karaoke. Um, on this side are 33 canvases, square canvases that comprise one single work, one individual work. Um, they are called the alphabet paintings. Um, there are 26 letters in the alphabet. You can count them. Um, then there are several canvases that don't have letters on them. Um, they are um, a great example of, of some of the t sort of technical innovations that Laura began to experiment with, the, the, um, the, needle, the different kinds of needlepoint or cruel work. Um, the, the different kinds of stained canvases or dyed canvases, the application of heavy impasto paint on the surface, um, the mixture of perspectives and layers, um, the depths inside depths inside depths or surfaces on top of surfaces on top of surfaces. Um, it's, there is no real distinction between surface and depth in Laura's painting. It's all kind of in a constant flux or play between uh, uh, those ideas, between surface and depth. Um, this is owned by a single person. These are all broken up um, and owned by different 
different collectors and museums. Um, who knows this, this rock group pavement? Does anybody know this rock group pavement? A couple of people raise their hand. Um, I asked Laura why she, um, why she titled this after this, this band, and uh, she, because this is, I don't know, if you grew up in the 90s or if you came of age in the 90s and were at all interested in kind of underground music or what they called indie rock or alternative music or college rock or whatever you called it, uh, they were a big important band. They, they sounded like a million different groups. They sort of really were successful at bringing their influences together uh, into a sound that, that, that when you heard it, then like, Wow, it sounded so distinct, but you could hear every other group in the world in it. You could hear a little bit of the Velvet Underground, you could hear a little bit of the Fall, you could hear a little bit of this, that, the other thing, but it sounded, they had such a very distinct sound. And I asked Laura why she titled um, these paintings Pavement Karaoke, and, uh, and she kind of didn't really answer me, and I said, well, is there any way that these paintings look like pavement sound, sounded or sounds? And she sort of smiled and she didn't answer exactly, but she said that um, uh, pavement was famous for um, making music that somehow held together amidst total chaos, that the, the, the guitars would be spiraling out over here and the drummer would be completely off the, off the beat and the singer would be, you know, um, screeching in um, some strange, you know, falsetto. And the, um, anyway, they just sounded like a wreck a shambles, um, and yet they held together, um, and yet they sort of lurched along and had incredible style. And I think that um, that 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 um, kind of baffling, the baffling presence of the structure in that um, chaotic music, the the fact that there was still structure within the chaos, was something that she appreciated or liked. And that's maybe maybe that's in there. Um, there is amidst all of these squiggles and all of these um, marks and the, the lava rocks that seem fl flung at the canvas like dung, uh, makes me think of Laura's friend Chris Ophelia, um, in fact. Um, there, amidst all of the grids, the broken grids, the overlaid grids, the, the fake computer paint, um, uh, paint gestures, um, there, there is somehow still some structure and some kind of thing that carries it through. Um, and maybe what carries it through is the presence of these kind of classified ads that are um, woven in there or deep in there. Um, I didn't even see these classified ads for the first, you know, several days um, of, of kind of hanging these paintings on the wall. I knew it was in there, of course, but then I couldn't, I couldn't really see it. You know, I was only looking at the surfaces, I was only looking at the dark marks, and I didn't see that, in fact, these classified ads, the negative space formed by the classified ads, spell out the words pavement karaoke. Um, that you can go from one canvas to the next with the letters and spell, spell the title of the, of the body of work. Um, there's just, there's a lot going on in these paintings. I mean, a lot formally and visually, um, it's, it's dizzy, it's kind of dizzying, I would say. Uh, let's go into this big gallery back here. In this part of the room, there is a group of paintings that stand up in open space. Um, we don't typically think about paintings standing up in open space. We think about sculptures standing up in open space. Paintings hang like that boy on the rope, at the end of his rope. Um, paintings hang on the wall. These paintings stand up, um, almost like, you know, some kind of magic trick. Uh, and they're painted on the front and the back. They, if you look at them from a certain sweet spot vantage point, which is somewhere around there, the words on the surfaces, the fronts of the paintings, line up in this kind of uncanny way. You know, these look like sheets of notebook paper. And the words will line up, and let me see if I can recall what it says. It says, there was a cat and an alien. They went to Antarctica. Then they teleported to the center of the Earth. There they got 11 billion bombs and blew them up and turned Earth. And then, you know, this, this little narrative seems like it's just dangling 
and it probably does just dangle for most of you, but if you kind of wander around the side over here and look at this painting, this more, more easel type painting, more hand, hand painted painting that's on the wall over here, the narrative concludes turned and turned earth into a pizza crust. Um, this is a kid's story. I guess one of Laura's children wrote this story. Uh, and uh, it, it wound up on the surface of, of these paintings. Um, I think that she was not, obviously not interested in this, well maybe she was interested in this as a, as a story, as a narrative, but I think what, what was most compelling to her was the way that the, the brain, the presence of the words um, on these kind of staggered cascade, cascading canvases lines up and your brain reads it seamlessly as a single plane if you're in the right location, if it lines up. Um, if it doesn't, if you're not in the right location and, it, and the text isn't lining up, it looks totally jumbled and disjointed and you can tell that there is depth and there is, um, you know, that there are five paintings that are kind of going back in space. It looks like it reads as three-dimensional space. But if you stand in a certain spot, it becomes, your brain turns it into a flat plane. Um, I think that's kind of what she was interested in, these, these, these kinds of anamorphic uh, pro perceptual problems. Um, these paintings also look like they were made on a computer. Um, they are heavily silk screened um, or printed, overlaid with, with different kinds of, um, of uh, screen effects. Um, but they also have these three-dimensional globs of paint coming off of them, kind of breaking the flatness, the digital flatness of the, of the, of the print, of the printing space. The, let's call it print space. Um, there are these kind of shadows which simulate or provide an illusion of depth, but really we see them exactly for what they are, which is digital pixelated shadows, fake shadows. I guess from a distance they would look, they might look different. Of course everything looks different at a distance. Um, these are paintings that you're meant to walk around, walk through, um, be aware of your body and relation to. Um, they kind of, they borrow from sculpture in that sense. Uh, and yet they are clearly, resolutely paintings. Um, they were made, like a lot of Laura's art is made, when she makes her art, she's thinking about the, the location where it's gonna be, the site where it's gonna be. Um, she thinks about her exhibitions and her paintings in, in, this, in this sense, kind of site specifically. This installation was not made for this room. It was made for a gallery in Berlin that had no real walls. The walls were all glass. Basically, the gallery was like a glass box. There was nothing, there was no way to hang art um, unless you brought in fake walls, and she didn't want to do that. That seemed sort of silly to hang, to hang paintings on, on sculptures. So she decided to make these things that would just stand up in the middle of the space and get rid of the problem altogether. Um, and then downstairs in the gallery, in an empty room down in the basement, there was this other painting, which is more obviously a traditional kind of painting um, by itself. The, the story about the earth being blown up by bombs and Antarctica and aliens, and it all ends with that little painting that was down in the basement. Um, let's turn our attention over this way. You know, I said that a lot of this work hasn't been seen in uh, Los Angeles. Um, that's kind of true until we get to this area. Um, some of you know that um, Laura was involved with a gallery here in the city called 356 Mission. It was over on Mission Road in Boyle Heights. Uh, it operated from 2012 to, 2013 rather, to um, last year, earlier, or earlier this year. Um, and it began as a way of, of Laura having a location to show her, her own work uh, in the city, in her home city. It began as a collaboration with her dealer, Gavin Brown in New York, and uh, Wendy Yao, who runs the um, kind of art book store and, and fashion store, Ooga Booga. 
uh, they got together and they, they ran this space for three years, four years. Um, maybe longer, maybe five years. The first show that was there was a show by Laura Owens herself called 12 Paintings, and it included 12 of these kinds of super large uh, canvases that you see here. Um, uh, these were the biggest paintings that she had made at the time, and may be still the biggest paintings that she made. Um, they uh, filled this huge warehouse space. I'm looking at you because you also showed in that space. How how big was that space? How, how big was that room? Four or five thousand square feet. So a very big open room, kind of a square room, and uh, all along the perimeter were these paintings. Um, uh, a lot of the things that Laura is now most associated with were in these paintings. This was a big time, big, big, big deal show for her. It got her a lot of attention. Um, and all of the paintings kind of, you know, they have like trademark classic Laura Owens motifs, the, the, the use of um, silk screen, painting on top of silk screen, um, this kind of fluid dynamic all over uh, a, a, a kind of composition, um, the use of classified ads or newspa newspaper blown up, extracted, excised, um, in this case turned into a cat form, um, the grid, the broken fractured grid uh, with the, the kind of fluid digital squiggle or brush stroke um, moving between it, uh, great sense of wordplay and humor, um, the rearranging of, of words um, from different source materials to create this kind of collage, almost collage poem uh, on the surface. Uh, the show kind of blew, blew people out of the water because Laura hadn't been exhibiting in the city for years and years and years and years and all of a sudden there was this. Um, and it was soon after that show happened that the Whitney got in touch with her and said, okay, it's time for you to have a big show in New York. Um, over here. These are paintings that are a little bit later uh, or a little bit more recent um, that were exhibited in London at Sadie Cole's gallery or um, in New York. Um, again, just kind of classic, classic Laura Owens. The, the, she found when she, was, when she was renovating her home, she found that some of her walls were filled with um, newspapers that had been there for 50 years, kind of were filled with newspapers as in, insulation and old copies of the LA Times from the 40s and 50s. And so she took some of this out and began to scan it and digitally rearrange it and put it with more recent, recent stories from the LA Times and, and to arrange, rearrange words and to drop in images um, from different time periods and to kind of create this fake newspaper um, arrangement or spread. She said she was interested in, in um, how a painting could be graphic design um, or how to turn a painting into graphic design. Um, these Doctor's Choice cigarettes were from, they're like a, a brand of candy cigarettes. Um, and they, they are in a couple of paintings, this painting and then another one somewhere else over here. There, thank you. Um, you can spend a lot of time looking at these, these things. Um, just endlessly inventive and funny and weird. Um, they, look, they look quite um, like, I don't know, sometimes you look at art, you can't imagine, you can't imagine how somebody came up with an idea and then when you see it, it looks so obvious and looks so like right and natural. And a lot of Laura's, uh, Laura's paintings have that uncanny effect for me. Like I would never in a million years have thought of a painting that looked like this, but then when I see it, it looks like a perfect painting. Um, it looks exactly in place and confident and coherent um, and ambitious. All right, um, let's go into this last room and then we'll wrap it up. So there's a lot about Laura Owens' art that is, um, is like super communicative. It's, um, 
it, it kind of pokes the viewer with these, these sort of questions about like whether it's okay to include this or that kind of imagery in a painting, whether it's um, wrong to like stuff animals, kitschy animal images onto a canvas, uh, whether there is a place in high art for the domestic arts, uh, whether these realms of, of, of domestic arts traditionally, historically associated with um, the feminine um, had a place in, in the most sophisticated uh, advanced painting. Um, there's a lot that sort of pokes the viewer or tries to engage the viewer in these, in these kinds of questions which are gendered questions, which are cultural questions, which are historical questions, which of course are aesthetic questions and visual questions too. Um, it's a really kind of like communicative, hyper-communicative, talkative, um, chatter-boxy kind of art. Um, I, 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 I like that. I like going, I like reacting against that. I like engaging with it. I like agreeing with it. I like disagreeing with it. I like being in a kind of, um, dialogic space with the art. Um, it's how I learn about art is from asking questions about it. Standing in front of it and going, what is going on? Why? You know? Um, it's pretty basic. And in this last gallery of the show, that sort of communicative space is literal. These paintings talk back to you. You can text them questions for real, you can text them questions and they will answer you. Um, some of the canvases have um, phone numbers on here and it'll say, got a question? Text me, 323-880-2951. And if you happen to take the painting at its word and text it a question, um, they, somehow from somewhere in this room there will be an answer um, made audible. Um, there are thousands and thousands of answers um, that are triggered by keywords. Um, everything from like, you know, where's there a good place to eat lunch by the Geffen? To like, what the hell was the curator thinking? To why, um, why is the sky blue? Like all kinds of questions will generate all kinds of answers. The answers don't make any sense. They don't, um, they don't really answer the, the questions that you ask. I mean, sometimes they kind of get close um, but, but often it's non sequitur answers. Um, but there is a cacophony, there is a kind of com communicative um, um, surplus, there is um, just a sense of like extra, too much overload uh, in this work that I think is kind of uh, quintessential Laura Owens. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>